world outside. You can have the world anytime you want, but right now we're going to Jesus. We're going to Jesus.
give our hearts to you right now. This is the people, the place, and the time that you're looking for. And so we're gathered in your name. Here you are in the midst of us. The only thing that would stop you, the only thing that can limit you is us. The only thing that could cause there to be a barrier, that could cause you to be thwarted in what we want to see accomplished in this meeting is us. right attitude, give us the right heart Lord, for while we're here. It's not just a social media, it's not just a, a fellowship of people, this is a, an encounter with God. We're here to touch the Lord and be touched by Him. We're here to make contact with the holiest and most beautiful and wonderful power that the world has ever tasted and it has no idea of the fullness of
are similar to you. No one who is even close to your beauty. No one. No one can even stand beside you. No one can stand next to your radiant glory.
love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this time. We thank you for this time together. We thank you that your presence is in this place. Lord, we are not going to do anything that could possibly stop you from moving and flowing. We're not going to do anything that could limit what you want to accomplish here tonight. We yield to you, Lord, in every respect. We give you room to do whatever you want to do. Forget the agenda of men. Forget the plans of men. What we want is you. What we want is you, Jesus. You're with us always. You never leave us. You never go away from us. You never abandon us. Sometimes we misunderstand. Sometimes we think that you, you've left us alone. But no, it's, it's always with a purpose. It's always with a plan for us to be better and stronger and taller and faster in you and mightier in the works that we are to achieve. We are your workmanship. And sometimes you work us hard. Sometimes you carve deep. Sometimes you sculpt with a chainsaw. Sometimes you work deep in us. And Lord, we know that even if it's painful, we have to trust that you know what you're doing. You are the master. So we yield to you, Lord, in season, out of season, no matter what happens, we yield to you. In the good times, in the bad times, in the easy times, and in the hard times, in the happy times, in the sad times. We yield to you. Bring us through the seasons, Lord. Bring us through the seasons. Let us be like Job. Though you slay me, yet will I serve you. Even if I think you're destroying me, I will still serve you. They'll tell me, curse God and die. And I'll say, no, though he slay me, yet will I serve him. Yes. Yes. Lord, you molded and shaped us. In our worst, in our worst state, in our weakest place, your grace is still a million times more than enough for us. You are our Savior. You are our sanctifier. You are our strength. You are our peace because we can breathe deep. And know that you're with us always. But speak to us tonight. Speak to us tonight.
loving on his children, loving on his little ones, whispering in our ears, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. <laughs> Don't worry, my little one. Don't worry, my little one. Come on, that's a word for more than one person here tonight. Don't worry, my little one. Everything is going to be all right. Everything is going to be all right. You say to the Lord, but, 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 he says, shh, 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 Everything is going to be all right. And then you say, but Lord, you, 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 and he's, shh, 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 shh. Everything is going to be all right. But, 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 shh, shh. But what about, no, shh, shut up. Everything is going to be all right. But did you forget about, no, shh, shh, stop. Your situation's different. Now shut up. No. No. You think that my God is stronger than your God? He's the same God. The same God that created the universe. The same God that put every star in its place. And there are trillions upon trillions of them. The same God that holds the universe together. The great and mighty and powerful. He is more than enough to be able to solve your problems. He's more than enough to be able to rescue you if you only cry out to Him. Whoever cries out, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved from whatever circumstance they're in. There is no circumstance that you can even invent that God wouldn't be able to figure out. Oh, but you don't know much. Uh, uh, uh. He's more than enough for you. He's more than enough for you.
the snap of his fingers, he can turn your worst nightmare into your most beautiful dream. You just, you just don't know. You just don't know how wonderful, how wonderful he is. He is so, so powerful. You just have to trust him. You just have to trust him. Just trust him. He's touching you right now because he's wanting to unlock your heart. He's wanting to unlock your soul. He's wanting to be at work inside of you. You just have to let go and let him in. Just let go and let him in. Let him change.
out of season. This comes from a passage of scripture in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and not. I focused on the phrase in season, out of season. And in introduction, I want to read another scripture to you with this out of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. To everything there is a season. Everybody say season. season. And a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. Well, you know that rings true in the minds of many investors in this current economic age. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. These words were spoken by the wisest man that ever lived. He said to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Every one of us has an off day now and then. We all experience good days and bad days. Sometimes we have good weeks and bad weeks, or even good years and bad years. How many of you ever had a bad year? Say amen. amen. Some people say, like, how about decade? <laughs> Century! Sometimes we go through hard times. You know, sometimes there's difficult things and trials, and certainly we know what it's like to have a bad week or certainly a bad day. There are days that, that I wish, even, even now, long after those days, I wish those days had never been. I wish I could go back and erase those days. Things happened on those days. I felt things on certain days that I never want to feel again. And, and, and those things are all part of the plan of God for our life. Even the bad. The fact is that we live in seasons and it seems that we are not in control of those seasons. It's like the seasons of the weather in most places on the earth. I say most places because Singapore don't have many seasons. Some people say there's three seasons here in Singapore. Hot, hotter, and aircon. <laughs> those who aren't local, aircon just means air conditioning. It's hot, hotter, and then you go in the mall and ah, get in the MRT. Ah, third season. Life comes in seasons, and we need to learn how to make it through every season with the Lord's help. When I say that we're not in control of those seasons, it's no more than we are in control of the weather. You know, I wanted to ride my bike today, and so early in the morning, I thought, wow, perfect weather. And so I figured, let me do a few last things in preparation for the service, and I'll go do my exercise. And by the time I finished and pressed save on my file, <laughs> <laughs> rain pouring down. I can't control the rain. I can't control the, the cold or the, or the hot. If you live in an area where there are seasons, the seasons are going to come and you wish you could orchestrate the seasons, but you can't. It's the same in our spiritual lives with the Lord. It's the same in the way we grow in Jesus, in the way we grow in the kingdom. You do not have control over the seasons that you go through. And so you're going to go through good seasons and you're going to go through bad seasons. And I want to talk about Elijah. Elijah is considered by many as a mighty man of God, fearlessly defending the Lord against the false prophets and speaking with authority. This is how most of us think of him. However, we also see that he had times of living in fear and despairing of life itself. In this message, we'll look at Elijah in both the good season and the bad season to examine some consistent elements in his life. So we'll see similarities and differences in the off and on seasons of life in God's kingdom while living here on earth. So in two parts, we're going to look at Elijah. We're going to see Elijah in season, and later part two will be Elijah out of season. There's in season and there's out of season. 
But remember when we started in the whole thing that kicked this off with me and my spirit was the scripture, be instant. My wife had a clever little revelation because I pulled that from the King James. Some other translations, be ready, be prepared, be this, be that. But the King James says, be instant. And my wife thought of those little instant pot noodles, you know. She said, you know the difference between noodles that are ready and noodles that are not ready are? And I said, well, she said, the water, the hot water. And it was interesting, she preached her own little message about like the hot water of the spirit that when we have the water added to us, we can be ready. But that's not really what this is talking about. My wife always does that. She has some revelation that it's good, but it has nothing to do with my revelation. <laughs> but I take a note without her seeing so I can make it a message that she don't know about. <laughs> I steal people's revelations. Because you know why? They're not their revelations. They come from heaven. That's it. That's it. That's it. Snatch it. Change the names and protect the innocent. <laughs> Well, I had this message, I had one of my missionaries do that to me. I had this message, a very famous message of mine years ago called, Who's Your Captain? And it was about the Lordship of Jesus Christ in your life. And I preached in a lot of places, and, and people loved it. And at that time that I was really preaching a lot, traveling with these missionaries, this, one of my missionaries liked it so much, he took it and he changed the name of Who's Your Daddy? <laughs> As I say, change the names or protect the innocent. Or change the names or protect the guilty. So in part one, we're going to see Elijah in season. Elijah was in his brightest moment in a season of God's best for his life and glory amongst men. We have seasons when we are exalted before men. And the Lord gives us amazing abilities and strength. And when it's on, it's on. And there's nothing you can do wrong when it's on. He gives you the Midas touch. I've lived in see I've lived in years like that before. During times of revival, he just decides because he has a great purpose and something he has to accomplish. Just electrify me and turn me on like a big switch that I can't touch. It's too, you know, the center of your back where you can't scratch. He has a button back there. And he turns you on or off as he wishes, and that's all part of the seasons. And Elijah was in that season. And we're going to see four things about being in season. And everybody loves this season. Number one, you have clear communication with God. When you're on, it's on. And God is like your next door neighbor. He walks in in the morning. Hi, how are you? And the voice is so clear. First Kings chapter 18, it starts off after a long time. In the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Think of this. He came to Elijah. The word came to speak to him, gave him clear instructions on what he should do. It was no guesswork involved. It was so easy. And it seems so easy to hear the voice of God during these seasons. We move in prophecy and have clear direction. We we'll feel confidence and strength. And this, of course, is our favorite time in life. I, would, I wish. And you know, I've been in seasons when they're extended like this, in season, that I, I knew that I had arrived. And I actually believed, and now I know better after years of experience, but I actually believed in those seasons, oh, this is heaven on earth. This is the way it will always be. I actually believe that. And I always, but no, it's, it's for seasons. I had one year, he gave me a whole year, 12 months of absolute holiness. And I'm not, I wouldn't say that if I didn't mean it, but I mean spotless. I was Saint Stephen, like for 12 <laughs> months, flawless, perfect, glowing light, floating. I didn't even walk, I floated. <laughs> Everywhere I went, this was during a great time of revival in Mexico. And, and, and it's wonderful because the voice of the Lord was so clear. And, but you know what happens after a while when you're in that place? You start, to, you start to look down on the people who don't hear it that way. You start to judge others. You become supercilious about them. And if you were holy, then you also would hear the voice of the Lord. And it's not always that because as one wise missionary friend of mine always told me, it's a function of function. When there's a purpose for your life, and God has you in a capacity for a season. He gives you the supernatural gift that you need. But he loves you so much that he will then take that season away from you. 
Because there's no way that you can become what you need to become if he perpetually keeps you in that place. But Elijah enjoyed it because the voice of the Lord was so clear. Second thing we had in this season, respect and honor. Now the famine was severe in Samaria, and Ahab had summoned Obadiah, who was in charge of his palace. Obadiah was a devout believer in the Lord. While Jezebel was killing off the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had taken a hundred prophets and hidden them in two caves, fifty in each, and had supplied them with food and water. Ahab had said to Obadiah, go through the land to all the springs and valleys. Maybe we can find some grass to keep the horses and mules alive so we will not have to kill any of our animals because of the famine. So they divided the land, and they were to cover it. Ahab going in one direction, Obadiah in another. As Obadiah was walking along, Elijah met him. Obadiah recognized him, bowed down to the ground, and said, Is it really you, my lord Elijah? And yes, he replied, Go tell your master, Elijah is here. <laughs> This dude was walking in power. He had respect and honor. Obadiah was like, oh, is Elijah fall down and bow to him? And Elijah knew that and was walking in that capacity. He was unstoppable. Respect. And honor. everybody likes to be respected. Everybody likes to be honored. Everybody likes when you walk into a place and they say, Oh, hello, Mr. Nico. How are you? Or, hi, how are you? Caleb, come on in. It's so good that you're here. Oh, look, it's Ann. Don't you feel good? And you walk even to a public place, you know, and they do it in front of all the other people, and all the people look, and who's that important person? And that's respect and honor. The Lord does that for us. The Lord gave me that in seasons and places I've worked in the world, and I still have it. And when I'm feeling kind of down about myself, all I need to do is get an airline ticket and go fly back to those places. <laughs> the Lord don't let me. <laughs> I'm going to go visit away for a while. <laughs> Why? You want to respect and honor? No. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I'm just kind of interested in seeing what's going on over there. <laughs> And because that's a place and a season that you feel good about. Now the scripture continues, and I want to read the whole story, and then we're going to see this next one. No, the, is there a scripture that comes after number two? Or go straight to number three? Okay, that's good. Number three, fearlessness and faith. It's the third element that you find in season. Elijah said, as the Lord Almighty lives whom I serve, I will surely present myself to Ahab today. Surely. Like and he just said, I will present. He said, I will surely present myself to Ahab today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. But you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the bells. Now summon the people from all of Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel. Now he's giving commands to the king. You understand? He's barking orders at the king. That's fearless. That's faith. He says it now. Summon the people, you little king, from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets back. What you got? And the 400 prophets of Asherah. And any other prophets you have tucked away somewhere who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets at, on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let them choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but do not set it on fire. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord, the God who answers by fire. He is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one of the bulls and prepare it first. Since there are so many of you, call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull, given them, and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Oh, Baal, answer us, they shouted. 
But there was no response, no one answered, and they danced around the altar they had made. <laughs> All day long. You ever see people dancing too long and they get the kind of a tired dance? <laughs> <laughs> At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he's a god. Perhaps he's in deep thought. <laughs> or busy. Or traveling. No. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice, but there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come here to me. They came to him, and he prepared the altar of the Lord, which was in ruins. Elijah took twelve stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seers of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bowl into pieces, laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, Fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said. And they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered. And they did it a third time. The water ran in down around the altar and even filled the trench. At that a time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O oh Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O oh Lord. Answer me, so these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God, and that you're turning their hearts back again. Then fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. Here we see absolute fearlessness, absolute faith, absolute focus. There's nothing that he doesn't have. This is as in season as you can get. And it's a wonderful place to be. And the fourth element of that is, of course, great success. When it's on, it's on. When you're in season, there's going to be fruit. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And that's an altar call. Everybody. Then Elijah commanded them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let any get away. They seized them. And Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered them. Great success. Every one of his enemies were eradicated. And you know, in the good seasons, everything we do results in great success. Elijah was in the prime of his life with God and enjoying all the benefits of being in season. And we all enjoy these times in life, but the fact is that we seldom grow during these seasons. This is not a time of growth. Success is not a catalyst of growth. Amen. In fact, a lot of people want successful times, but they are not as advantageous to you as the other seasons. And, and it's fun, of course, because you feel like everything's going well, but you're not going to grow by it. In fact, you're going to grow further away from God in your seasons of success. Because you'll become more and more confident in yourself and your own abilities and your own strengths, and you'll believe yourself is capable, and you will begin to forget what you're made of and where you've come from. But God is really good at reminding you. And so he changes the tide. He changes the season. Things transform. Just as we saw in Ecclesiastes, there's a time for everything. And soon after such a season of greatness will come a season of trial. And this is exactly what happens with Elijah. So we come to part two. Elijah, out of season. Now we've seen him in season. And it's glorious. It's wonderful. How many of you want to be Elijah in season? Yes. I do. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting that. We should want to have great and wonderful seasons. But understand this, that you can't have the in season without the out season. Yes. Because the out season is what makes you able to be in the in season. And if you're not on the out, you'll never be on the in. If you're only on the in, then eventually you'll work your way out. And you'll get into trouble. And so, the second part, Elijah out of season. Let's look at the off season. We're going to see seven things. They don't take long. And then we're going to pray after that. Number one, man's word, not God's word, will lead us into the off season. Now, this is, by the way, the very next chapter. 
Nothing has happened between the first story we just looked at of great success and this second story. So he is now walking, Elijah. Elijah is now walking with, with having come right out of this wonderful experience. And you would think that he would carry out of that experience all of that fearlessness, that faith, that confidence. And you know what? If the season had continued as it was, he would have all that. Because it would be a function of function, and that would be the purpose of the Lord for him in the field that way. But what you don't understand is when we give our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ and we yield to him, we submit to him, he becomes the master of us, and he has strings tied to our emotions, to our heart, to our motives, to many things, and he can change things inside of us. You ever wake up and suddenly not feel like reading the Bible anymore? And it's like the worst thing in the world you can think of doing. But yet just for months before that, it was all you wanted to do was read the Bible, the Bible, the Bible, the Bible, all the Bible. And you thought, finally I've arrived. And You know, I used to hear about people that didn't have a desire to read the Word. And, but now I have this desire. And I am holy. And I am the Bible master. And I can know it. And then all of a sudden, just the very next day, you wake up and you have no desire to read that book at all. Because there's seasons of the Word. There's seasons, seasons of prayer. And then you wake up one day and the last thing you want to do is pray. You don't feel like praying. You don't feel like talking to God. You love the Lord. It's not that. You're not suddenly turning your back on the Lord. And you know it's true. You still love Him with all your heart. But what you had as a prayer life, suddenly you have no motivation to do it at all. Welcome to the new season. Welcome to the off season. But now you have an obligation to be instant in both. You need to be consistent whether you're in season or out of season. You have to do the same thing. I was reading the prerequisites of the leaders of churches in 1 Timothy today, and it was talking to Timothy about what you need to do to be a church leader. And it said you need to be committed to consistency in meetings and public readings and in teaching and indoctrinating, and it has to be consistent whether you feel like it or not. Sometimes I sit up here, I lead worship, and I preach, and out there, you're weeping and enjoying and having a great time, and you would think that I'm having the time of my life, but I don't even want to be here sometimes. <laughs> I'm being honest. Sometimes I'm out of season, but I have an obligation and a promise and a commitment that whether I'm in season or out, I'm going to come here, and I'm going to bring my game face to the match, and I'm going to give you my A game. Every service, I'm going to give you everything I have. And sometimes I feel so out of sorts and so unanointed and so unblessed that I'm absolutely flabbergasted that he even shows up. But yet he does. Because you see, what I've learned in a quarter of a century of ministry is that the seasons have no effect on God, they have effect on you. The seasons do not even tamper with or even touch the anointing. They can't even get close to it. No matter how cold it gets, the anointing is hot. And nothing can stop it. And if you learn to trust the Lord as Elijah has to learn, for him to get where he is headed to, he has to go through this bad season. You have to go through that too. And we're all going through it. But it's often man's where it says, So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. Jezebel wrote this down, obviously gave it to the messenger. The messenger took it on the scroll, stood up in front of Elijah, opened it up and read it, delivered, not from God. Remember that our last story that we looked at, it says, and the word of the Lord came to Elijah. But now, the word of a man comes. And, and in the first story, God spoke, and now we see the voice of man. Jezebel was a manipulative and evil witch that used words to pervert and destroy the people of God. She was the devil's servant. Beware of the servants of Satan that have been employed to hurt you. We can use their tactics to help you grow if you have the right attitude. Amen. And those people are brought to you, the worst Jezebels are brought as a gift from God to your life. And all of that may seem ridiculous and impossible to understand or believe, believe me, it's God. 
Because if it were the opposite and God only gave you good seasons, then he would have eradicated that, that adversary a long time ago and you would only have advocates and people to stand with you. But then you wouldn't be biblical because no Bible character in all the word of God did not have adversaries. Because that's the pattern of the New Testament church. There's actually four A's. You've heard me mention them before. We have action, adversity, authority, advance. Repeated again and again in the book of Acts. You do anything for God, you take action, adversity rises, you take authority, and then you advance. But the adversity is always in the second position. So he did a great thing. That's wonderful. But now, as this messenger comes with the message from Jezebel, what do you do? You would think that Elijah, at that point upon receiving the message, having come out of such a wonderful victory and conquering the prophets of Baal and such a display and all the people so happy, you think he would have stood up, Elijah is here again. But he doesn't do that at all. Look what he does. Number two, fear comes in the off season when we believe the word of the enemy. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba and Judah, he left his servant there. Now this is a very different Elijah, isn't it? The first Elijah was marching straight up to the king and barking orders at him. The first story, which was just last chapter, he was doing everything. Why? Because he was in season. But now he's out of season. Things are changing. Things are different. He doesn't have that, that gift of fearless faith inside of him, and suddenly he has fear. Fear is a catalyst of growth and development. It is a tool that can make you reevaluate yourself and your self-assessment. It adjusts your self-image and causes you to mature. Remember that God is not giving you that fear but that it is useful to God in his amazing work of cultivating you. Now, he hasn't given us a spirit of fear. He gave us power, love, sound, and I know the scriptures. But fear is something the enemy uses that God allows to be able to sculpt and mold you as he wishes. The enemy has always been a pawn in the hand of God. So also was Jezebel in this story with Elijah. Jezebel is just doing what Jezebel was designed to do as a pawn in the hand of God. Number three, we want to die in the offices. <laughs> Not only do we want it, he prayed that he might die under her. He prayed for death. How many of you have ever been there? I've been there. While he himself went a day's journey into the desert, he's running, he's afraid, he's scared, he leaves the servant behind, he goes a whole day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down in the tree and fell asleep. <laughs> Poor larger. Well, what a contrast. What a contrast from Elijah is here, standing up in the face of the prophets, confronting the king, barking orders. All of a sudden, and I've always wondered why would this this big turnaround. And, and when I read that scripture, I was I went I read the scripture, but in season, out of season. That's true, man. When in, when you're in season, you feel great. But when you're out of season, there's just like nothing, and you, you become a different person. And yet God is still faithful, and He cares for you. And I went. Bike riding, the Lord spoke to me while I was riding my bike. And he says, it's the same with Elijah. Remember, he started speaking to me. The Lord started preaching this message to me. I got so excited about it, I, I cut my bike ride a little short and went home real quick. I didn't want to lose the message. And this is what he talked to me about. And we want to die. There's been times I just, I, I just rather die. I started thinking about, you know, heaven would come. If I die, at least I go to heaven and I gotta stay here. We want to die because we're supposed to die to ourselves. And all that we consider to be our strengths and abilities. Perhaps Elijah had grown overconfident in his ability to minister and achieve in life. Maybe he began to feel like it was him that was so powerful. The events of the first story show Elijah's a great hero, but now he looks like a great coward. Kind of embarrassed. This is when you don't want to identify with Elijah. You want to identify with the Elijah of the chapter that came before this, the eight to chapter 18, Elijah is awesome. Chapter 19. Elijah is a little embarrassing. But you are both, you understand. And you have been both. And if you're more than a week old in the Lord, you know this. 
One day you're standing tall, and the next day you are worthless, and you have no strength, no desire, and you think, what happened to that guy or that girl in the church service that made that vow? What happened to me? Why is it that I was like that, and I used to feel this, and I used to feel that, and now this? Well, I'm kind of answering your question. We often walk in pride and start to steal the glory of the Lord. God will deal with us and adjust our feelings about ourselves. And that's the whole thing. If you start to trust yourself and believe in you and have self-esteem about your ability, then he will arrange an off-season. He has a special off-season just for you. <laughs> and he will bring you right into it to knock those legs out from under you and show you who you really are. Mature believers that have been through this off-season, in-season, out-of-season pattern, let's say a hundred times, you know, these are like the 40-year-old Christians. If not 40 years old, but 40 years in Christ. You know the kind. They just got, they're the same whether they're in season or honest. They really are instant in season. It's all the same to them because they've learned to connect to the anointing and never themselves. They've learned to only connect to the Lord. Sometimes it's going to rain. Sometimes the sun is going to shine. Sometimes there's, there's going to be a lot of money. Sometimes there's not going to be any money. Sometimes you're rich, sometimes you're poor. Some of the richest people I ever knew are poor right now. I have some millionaire friends that live in central um, U.S. and they have factories and they have nothing now. They're living in borrowed rooms and, and camps on lakes. Millionaires. Economy shifted, things changed. There's in seasons and there's off seasons. But what about you and your relationship with God? What about your connection to the Lord? Number four. Supernatural strength comes in our off-season. This is finally some good news. All at once, an angel touched him and said, now remember last we left him, he's crying under a tree. And he's miserable. But all at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his feet was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat. <laughs> for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, and by the way, this was not McDonald's. <laughs> this was straight from the heavenly grill. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night. Supernatural strength. Elijah cried out to God in his fear and despair, and God sent help. And really, that's what it's all for. The off-season is so that, in fact, we don't see anywhere in chapter 18 Elijah crying out to God from a perspective of anguish and difficulty. He's crying out to God, barking orders again. Oh, God, bring down fire. Or judge them. Do this, do that. He has strength. He has potency about him. But here he's, kill me. I want to die. Take me away from this place. But strength comes. When we find ourselves tormented in fear, if we turn to God for help, he will send it. Sometimes that help is a simple idea or revelation. Sometimes the angel touching you and feeding you is just an idea. And sometimes just one simple idea can turn the tide in your life entirely. And that's when you know it's a revelation from God because you were depressed, you were angry, you were ready to die, and instantly, suddenly, an idea comes and it's like a breath of life. And you know that the Lord has spoken to you. Although there was no lightning, there was no rain, there was no thunder, you knew at that moment. And that's exactly the lesson that the Lord is trying to teach you. Number five, the word of the Lord comes in our off-season after we receive supernatural strength. The Lord comes and does that, and then the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down their altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The word of the Lord comes. In that off-season, we get that strength, but then the Word comes to speak to us and give us a test or process us, and that's what really the off-season is all about. It's you being changed so that He can bring you to a different place, and that's number six. The Lord visits us to teach us at the end of the off-season. 
See, first, this is how it works. He brings you into the off-season, and he doesn't tell you anything. And that's what makes it the off-season. Because you hear no voice, and you have no direction, and you feel like you've made a mistake, and you check all your, your, your writings and see if you dotted all your I's and crossed your T's. When did you sin? How is it that this happened? And you ask questions that have no answers, and you do this for a long time, and you get in desperate state of crying out to the Lord and still nothing until finally that idea comes, the thing comes, and then the Lord has you in the position of desperation, and that is the stage of divine discontentment that He needs to bring us all into if we ever want to become what He wants us to become. We don't enjoy it, it's not fun, but it's the best time of your life in Christ. The worst times of your life in your perception and your understanding are the best times of your life in God. Because he's getting more accomplished and he's doing deeper works. That's when you're Gideon in the wine press, threshing your wheat, hiding from the Amalekites, and the angel steps in and says, Mighty man of God. And you say, yeah, If I'm so mighty, why am I hiding in a wine press? I taught a message years ago called, What's the Deal? <laughs> What's the deal, man? I, I'm supposed to, you know, this sucks. Excuse the language. <laughs> you ever say that? Just this, this just sucks. It's horrible. The Lord visits us to teach us at the end of that off season. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. The Lord is about to pass by. This is a visitation. And why is he visiting? And it says that a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mount, or the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? You understand this is the same thing that he said in the verse before that we read, but he made him go out and stand there, and he taught him an object lesson. You have understandings. You have ideas about what God is and about how the kingdom works and what the voice of the Lord is. You might think it's a wind. No, I'm not in the wind. You might think it's an earthquake. <laughs> nope, that's not me. You might say, well, it's like fire. It's burning our oh, holocaust. And God says, nope, not in that. You understand what he was trying to do was reorient Elijah and bring him to a place of understanding that it's not about all the tricks and the fads and the fancy, but it's a still, small, quiet voice from within your heart. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant and broken down your altars and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Number seven. We are restored and improved by the end of the off-season. You know what, though? Even though you're restored and, and, and improved, you don't, you don't enter back into the end-season with pride. You're quite the opposite at that point. You enter into it with humility. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Al. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mahola, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. And this is the whole reason why we go through such things. The Lord was prepared Elijah for the most amazing event of his life, his ascension into heaven in the fiery chair. The very next step from here, you know the story. He goes right, he meets Elisha, he throws his mantle on him, that whole process takes place for him to call him, and he brings him and leads him straight to the place where he can be taken up in the fiery chair which was the greatest thing he'd ever experienced, and it was the most wonderful moment of his life. Because every time you go through these seasons, it's because it is to prepare you for the next great season. The in season is coming. Yeah. And remember that we are in a seasonally oriented process of development. If you find yourself in a time of extreme child, child take heart because you are about to be promoted. 
The good news about hardships and difficulties and trials is that you are right in the waiting room of a great adventure with God. Mm -hmm. You're in the place being positioned and prepared. Now, this is the thing I cannot tell you. I cannot give you a calendar of seasonal events for your life. I cannot tell you how long. Only the Father knows the times and the seasons. And he brings you into a difficult, long time of trial and testing. Sometimes that thing can go for 20 years. I've seen ministers brought into 20 years of just being put on the back burner and left for dead in the middle of nowhere. And nobody knows and no one's seen them. Talk to Reinhard Bunke. Years on a corner with an accordion with a handful of sweaty tracks. Nobody listening to him. Nobody wanting to talk for years and years and years. Everybody rejected him. And God just left him out there to simmer in that pot. Because he had a desire for that man one day to put him in a position to bring more souls to Christ than any human being that has ever walked on planet Earth. So that he could have one service with 1.6 million people there. And measure, measure decisions for Christ in the millions in his ministry on even a monthly basis. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. But he, I'm sure Reinhardt wasn't thinking about that when he was in that off-season playing his noisy little accordion on the corner. We go through times. We go through off-seasons. We go through trials. But it's all because this is the process the Lord brings us through. I've lived this pattern again and again for the last 26 years, my whole life in Christ. I've seen it. My ministry started that way. I got saved. I was born again. The power of God came to me. I had visitations of the Lord early in my Christian experience. And they were so excited. I was so, so happy to feel the anointing and learn about God. And, and then something happened. Some of you heard the story about when he came to my room and the glory of God came and I fell and I cried and you could feel it in the air and the maps illuminated and I could see the souls and it was wonderful. Heaven came into my room, but then that was the in season and after that came an off season. When there was nothing and nothing seemed to work and nothing was working right and, and I wondered if I had ever even met, was that really God that came to that room? And I would shake myself and say, it was. But in the off-season, it's hard to even justify the things you experienced in the in-season because they're so otherworldly. Because they are otherworldly. See, the in-season is when you are so heavenly-minded, you become no earthly good. The off-season is when you're so earthly-minded, you can't see heaven anymore. But you need both to bring the balance for you to be a functioning tool in the hands of God on earth. And Elijah found this out the hard way just like you did. After that great experience, I had a really rough time. And suddenly, everything that I called Christianity, everything I called faith, it just got boring. I didn't want to go to church anymore. I still went, but I didn't want to. I read my Bible, I didn't want to. Do you ever get to the point where you're reading the Bible, but you can read it, and then put it down, and you have no idea what you just read? And you know what I'm talking about. I'd still read it like taking aspirin or medicine every day. I'd read it. Read my word. I would read it, and I would pray. <laughs> Mumble some words, but I didn't feel anything in that dry season. I finally got to the point where I felt like, well, God just didn't love me anymore. <laughs> so I ran off, and, and, and just I, I, I didn't stop going to the church, but I just, you know how it is sometimes, you just kind of feel like you need to go somewhere else. And I ended up working uh, for my aunt, this is when I was a young man, before I went into the ministry. And I went out to work on some property there, and at that time I just decided, you know, most of what I had seen in Christianity was false anyway, and they were all a bunch of liars, and the people were cheaters and stealing, even the pastor betrayed me, and this guy, and that, everybody let me down, and, and see, every, that's all part of the off-season too. The off-season is you being let down by everybody and everything and everyone you trusted. And the ones you put the most faith in, and believe the most in, because they will always be there with an anointed hand of prayer for you, and then they cut you off, even lie about you, and you think, everybody's left me. I like Paul writes it in one of his letters, everybody left me! writes it in the letter. Because it's when he was in an off-season. God's a jealous God. 
You get too close to people, he'll cut those people off of your life. Because <laughs> he wants to be first, and he will be first. Amen. And I separated, I was out working, and, and I was with my father. It was me and my alcoholic father working together, who never gave his heart to Christ, and never has yet, and still is not receiving Jesus. And Dad, if you're watching this YouTube video, get saved. <laughs> <laughs> But he knows he would be laughing right now if he saw that. And he, he might have to tell him to send him an email. Watch this video. I'm talking about you, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> and I worked and taught and tried to tell him about Jesus. And he just he didn't listen. So I just, I just began to question, why am I even on earth? What's this all for? And I got to the point where I went under the broom tree. And I sat down and I just said, I'd just rather die. I wasn't able to, to keep my vessel pure any longer. And I won't go into detail about what that means. You walk in holiness for a while, and then all of a sudden, you lose holiness. And it's like you just feel like you're caught up in a current that's taking you to do the things. Like Paul says, the things I want to do, I don't do. Things, the things I don't want to do, I end up doing. Oh, wretched man that I am. You just end up, that's the off season. And, and it's only when you finally get to the point where you think you only deserve to die and that God has no use for you anymore that God can finally have use for you. I know it sounds like a cruel process, but that's only because it's a cruel process. <laughs> but it's meant as a forging fire. Forging fire isn't a, like a, being on the side of an of a ocean with a beach and a, you know, and you're in a Mai Tai and you're in your little drink. No, it's a forging fire. It's hot. It's supposed to melt you down, break you down. That's what those times are for. And I was out there and I, and I, and I was at the point, this was before going to the ministry, before going, I, I was still debating. I knew the Lord had called me. He showed me the nations, but I didn't know how to get from point A to point B. I just didn't care anymore. Forget it. And I, I remember hiding in this little camper and in the, this little uh, caravan, little trailer, whatever you call it in your culture. And that little camper, it's like a little tiny room with wheels on it, a little tiny bathroom. You go in there like this and close the door. <laughs> a little bitty place. And I was in that room and I just, I, I, it was the day that I went to die and give up on Christianity. And I was by myself. And I told the Lord, I'm sorry, Lord, I can't do this. I can't do it. Just like Elijah said. I can't handle it anymore. I, I know you, you got great plans for me, but you chose the wrong God. I can't do it. At my very best, I'm awful. And I know you've made a mistake. Even You probably mixed my name up with somebody else's name in heaven. <laughs> And you told me, I know, I'm going to go to the nations, but guess what? I don't see it as any way even remotely possible for me to do that. So, move along. I literally told God to move along. Leave me here to die. And I began to weep and cry, and I crumbled on the ground, and I crawled under a little table, and that little table was, had a silver pole right down the middle, and I balled up around the silver pole and that, under that little table and whimpered like a hurt puppy and cried and cried all night long in a fetal position. You don't do this in front of people. You do this locked in a room. <laughs> But we all go through it. The lowest of the low of you when it's finished. And you at that moment, you just want to die. And I felt that way. And I cried and cried and cried. And I gave up. I gave up. Forget it. And the Lord came to me in that room. In that little camp. Suddenly, the angel of the Lord came and tapped me on the shoulder and said, Kid, and the Lord's presence filled that little room. And he said, son, he said, everything you've been trying to do, I've had nothing to do with it at all. I've not called you to do things. I was trying to do so many things, and it wasn't really the Lord's plan. And he said, son, I love you, just like you are. I love you. You don't have to do anything special to earn my love. If I use you, I'm going to use you because of me, not because of you. And I cried even more. <laughs> but I was totally humiliated by the experience. 
And with my head hanging low and my shoulders low, that next weekend the church service came. And I used to sit in the front row of the church with a tie and, and I used to run to throw the covers on the people who fell out of the power and the spirit. And I would be the one to hand out the envelopes. And I'd be the one to look for the new visitors. Is there anyone here for the first time? I'd be the guy running with the envelopes. And no, not anymore. Give up on all that. I didn't care anymore. I was hiding in the back of the church. Just hiding back there. And the pastor was preaching. He didn't know where I had been. I'd missed a couple of services. And he didn't know that I was even in the room. Because as I said, I was hiding in the back of that particular room. Could seat 600 people. So it was big enough to hide in. And I just kind of back there. Then we had pews. You know, pews are right? benches. And I could lower myself enough to where I could just the eyes could look over the pew. <laughs> and he was preaching. In the middle of his message, the Spirit of the Lord fell on him. And he said, where's Stephen? <laughs> and you know, at that moment, you perk up. <laughs> and I didn't move. And everybody started looking around. The Lord has a word for Stephen. Where's Stephen? He's from the country, so he had to talk like that. Where's Stephen? And, and I kind of raised my hand, and he said, come here. And I went to the front. i never forget this. And he stepped down from the stairs from the platform, and he said, the Lord showed me you, and you're in a little room. It's like a little tiny room, and it looks like a camper <laughs> because it has wheels on it. And you're, you're on the floor. In fact, you're under a little table. <laughs> you're wrapped around the pole of the table. I'm not kidding. This is exactly how clear the word was. You're wrapped around the pole of the table and you're crying, you want to die. It's just, you feel like there's no use for your life. It's the end of everything. But I'm here to tell you that God brought you to that point because he had to break you down so that he could build you up. And you're going to do, he started prophesying about what I was about to do going to the nations. And it was such a glorious moment. But I had to get, I learned so much. I look back on it thinking it's the best season of my life, those dry moments. And you think, oh, well, when you got through that, everything was okay? No, I just went through a short in-season into the next out season. <laughs> then I went through another in-season and another <laughs> I've been through about 50 or 60 of them now. Because that's the way it works. You don't have one winter every five years. Every year, winter comes around. <laughs> Fall, spring, sun, every year. The monsoon comes. I lived in two countries where this monsoon was so extreme, it was absolute dry. Nothing one day, and the next day it rained for seven days straight. <laughs> in India, Mumbai, was like that. When the monsoon started, that was it. it start, when, when it started, it didn't stop. It rained and rained and rained and rained and rained and rained and rained. And, rain. and before that, in, Me in Mexico and southern Mexico, we had a dry season of nine months every year with not even one drop. Every year. And by the end of May, it would get so miserably hot, 43, 44 degrees, and just you would die and you'd pray for the rain. And, and finally the rain would come. And when it would start, about a week after it started, you'd be praying for it to stop. <laughs> it's just rain and rain. You get depressed if it doesn't stop raining. <laughs> and that's how it is in seasons in our life. That's how it is. Look, if you're here tonight and you're thinking, well, you know, I'm glad to hear that because I thought I was the only one. No, you're not good. This is where we are. This is how we live. God loves you too much to leave you in the up season, to leave you out there because you would become a monster. <laughs> You'd be so full of pride and so self-focused and self-centered and you would think yourself to be so great and God doesn't want that. What are the sacrifices he requires? A broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Not someone who believes they can and I will do it. He wants humble people. He wants people that are afraid to even lift their head, that they stand with their head hanging low and they beat their chest. We saw this. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And that's what he's looking for. But I do have good news for you tonight. If you're in an off season, get ready because here comes the end season. But I also have news for you that are in an in season. Get ready because here comes the off season. <laughs> All I knew is this. 
Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near you. There are seasons, and in those days, make hay while the sun is shining, my mother used to tell me. I don't know exactly what that means, but I know it's applicable. <laughs> Apparently when the sun's shining, you can make hay, and when it's not, you can't. But anyway. <laughs> Do whatever you have to do when you can because tomorrow you won't be able to. Believe me, you know, when I have a season of the Word that comes on me, I prepare seven and eight messages in a day. And I just tuck them away. I tuck them away. Why? Because I know there's going to be a dry spell in the future and I'm going to have to feed off of that hidden man. And I do that. I have stockpiles of messages you don't even know about. <laughs> because I know times will come where I'm going to be sitting there, Lord, give me revelation, and all I'm going to hear is crickets. <laughs> and I need to go back. And that's exactly what, what the Word of God says. Religious leaders are like a homeowner that have old and new things, and they take from the old treasures, and they bring them up. Why would they have to do that? Because they go through off seasons. But what we need to learn to be is instant. And Elijah didn't quit. He wanted to die, but the Lord strengthened him. Technically, he quit. He got under a tree, ran away, and said, kill me. But technically, he responded when the strength came, and the Lord will come and do that for you. Amen? Amen. It's interesting to prepare this message today because it happened to me today. Today, God came to me while my wife and I were talking over breakfast and, and praying together. Today, the Lord came and, and visited me. And I've been in a real dry season. Most of you probably don't even know it. But once again, that's none of your business. That's my personal life. <laughs> Concerning the ministry, I'm going to do it. I'm coming. Come hell or high water. If, if I have to come with a severed leg bleeding out, I'm going to stand here and I'm going to do my job. In season and out of season, we have to make a promise. Amen? Why don't we stand our feet? We're going to pray. Jesus, Lord, we thank you for this word tonight. We thank you for the example of Elijah for us, someone who, who was a great man of God. And you've called all of us to be great men and women of God. There's times that we're going to fly high and we're going to soar in the sky and everyone's going to look at us and say, wow, look at them go. So anointed, so blessed, so wonderful. And we're going to feel it. And we're going to be excited to be alive and think there's nothing greater than this at this moment. But then the time will come when we won't feel it. And we'll be going through trials. We'll be going through difficulties. And, and those are your times also. Because unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it will abide alone. And so we have to go through that process. And Lord, we just want to give you praise tonight and give you thanks for the off-season as much as the in-season. Thank you for the trials. The trials prove that you love us. The off-season shows that you love us enough to cultivate us, to Make us the workmanship that you're working in. We are your workmanship. We are your work of art. And you're sculpting and carving and doing what you need to do in us. And we yield to you. In both cases, we see with Elijah that the Lord was there with him. Maybe not in the same fashion, in the same way, but the Lord was there. He was with him in the good. He was with him in the bad. He was with him in the in season and he was with him in the off season. In fact, he spoke to him a lot more in the off-season than he did in the in-season. Elijah spoke a lot in the in-season. But God spoke volumes and taught object lessons and gave instructions very carefully in the off-season. So, Lord, we invite you to teach us. We just want to be led by your Spirit at all times. Lord. Let's just ask him to breathe on us again with the song that we do all the time. Come breathe upon me.
Yes, Lord. 